Father, we thank you once more that you have brought us safely here. We pray for your guidance of opening our minds and our hearts so that we can really understand and hear. And we know that when we do that, that we must be willing to receive everything you show us so that we can do it by your grace. Bless us now as your spirit speaks to us. Amen. Romans, the eighth chapter is so big. It would take probably about six months for us to really get into it to see what's there. But we don't have six months. You have Bibles. You have the Spirit of Christ to talk to. You have the Spirit of prophecy. Dig. See what's in Romans 8. As it is, we have only taken one meeting for each chapter. And you really are are only getting the surface, the tops of it, in that one hour. But there's enough that all of us can realize this is not what we have been hearing. Because if you're having to wrestle with in your mind with some of the ideas that Paul is saying, hearing them through Luther, for example, that means it hasn't been part of your life before. You didn't hear it that way. You didn't understand it that way. So the important thing about what we're doing here is not to tear something down, but to find what Jesus is really saying and how Christianity really works. Because what good is it if we keep playing church and nothing comes out of it? We've got to do the plan of salvation the way God does it. All right, we're going to... Uh, Look at just little pieces of Romans 8, because like I say, it's just too big. But we'll see enough to know that there's something there that we need to go digging to find out what it really is. So, Paul begins, there is therefore. So he reached the therefore again. <laughs> Before, he said therefore being justified by faith. and then. But now he's reached another a therefore. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now we all know that. There's nothing new in this, these few words. But I would like you to be reminded along with me just now that he did not say in the Father. He did not say in the Holy Spirit. He said, in Christ Jesus. And I think that's very important. We need to keep things just the way the Bible says them and stop putting in our own little stories. Okay, so it says, in Christ Jesus. Now, it says, who? The ones who are not condemned anymore are those who have Jesus. Who? Walk. Now that walk does not mean faith alone. <laughs> walk means you're doing something. For those who walk not after the flesh, you mean a person who is in Jesus Christ, who is not condemned, has flesh? Oh, what's going on? He's really laying things on us here that we have not been told before. Yes, you have flesh. Sarkikos in the Greek, which means sin. Well, you can't walk in the flesh if you don't have it. <laughs> okay. So he says you're not condemned. You're in Jesus Christ. But don't walk in the flesh. You can if you want to, but don't do it. So he says, but after the Spirit. So you have both the Spirit and the flesh at the same time. This is really hard on people. I've been getting email. People asking me, what is this? They never thought about having 
doing both of them at the same time, and that's a Christian. You see, we did not become that mighty, spiritual, all the way righteous, holy person that never sins when we were baptized. It didn't happen. And we thought, man, there's something really horribly wrong with me because I'm not supposed to be a sinner anymore. Well, you are a sinner. And you might as well get used to it. You're a sinner. But you're also righteous. <laughs> That's the part we're not used to. We figure if you're a sinner, you can't be righteous. If you're righteous, you can't be a sinner. No, you're both of them at the same time. And when we finally understand that, we'll stop being so depressed about every little thing we do. We'll know there's something horribly wrong about sin, and we need to stop sinning. But we need to know it's not automatic. We have to struggle. So, if you don't want to struggle, go find another religion. <laughs> I used to tell Seventh-day Adventists that in church all the time. If you don't like being a Seventh-day Adventist, get out and become a Baptist. <laughs> yeah! As a pastor in the churches, I used to say that to people. If you don't like doing things God's way, get out! <laughs> Leave us alone! That's another thing I said. <laughs> All right, that was back then. But now we're reading Paul, okay? It says, Those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life, there's a law of life. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. He always says that. He never says the Father or the Holy Spirit. It's always Jesus. And I'm saying that for a reason, because I've gotten a lot of emails about something that people are saying out there. It says, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. What is that? That's the flesh. That's the body. As long as you have the body, you have the law of sin and death. But you're not supposed to pay attention to it. You're to resist it. You're to fight it. Verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Now he's using the right word. See, the flesh. God sending his own son. Sending who? You mean God has a son? <laughs> How can the churches teach God doesn't have a son? Because they're in the flesh, that's why. And they are following the flesh, not the Bible. So God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, I'm so glad Paul put that word in there. Because in the Seventh-day Adventist church, there are thousands of people who think the likeness of sinful flesh means Jesus was just like us. But the word likeness doesn't say exactly the same as you. It says likeness. Which means he is not sinful flesh. It's only a likeness. There was nothing sinful about Jesus. And people hate it who have misunderstood the gospel to hear that. They want Jesus to be somehow in the same trouble they're in so he understands. Well, you know what that is? That's an excuse to sin. If you make Jesus like you, then it's okay to be you sinning. Well, I could go off into lots of directions with what Paul is doing here, but we're not going to do it. We want to see what he's saying here as a message. Now, I think maybe it's time to get into Alan White a little bit here. Youth Instructor, September 21, 1899. Christ took upon him the form of sinful man. 
Now, did she say Jesus became a sinful man? Of course not. Did he have sinful flesh? No, he didn't have sinful flesh. He took the form, the likeness. In Hebrews, it says God prepared a body for him. Would God give him a sinful body? Come on. So let's read this correctly. It says, Christ took upon him the form of sinful man, clothing. She uses the word, he, he garbed himself. He had the garb. He clothed himself. He clothed his divinity with humanity, but he was holy. Is that just like us? I don't know. People can read the Spirit Prophecy and come up with all those weird things. They believed ministers. Yes, I know who the ministers were. I knew some of them personally. I know them today, the ones that are still alive. But he was holy even as God. Are you hearing what the Spirit is saying? Jesus, the divine Jesus, took the form of a man but he was holy as God. That man was God in him. But people don't read it that way. They say he was holy the same way that God is holy. That's not what she said. She said he as God was holy in that man. You see, our brains play strange tricks on us. Let's read the way Ellen White writes, okay? She says, but he was holy even as God is holy. He was the sin bearer needing no atonement. Had, had he not been without spot or stain of sin? How many ways could she say this? Without spot or sin, he could not have been the Savior. And I, and I tell that to every one of these people I meet on the street that says, oh, he was just like us. I tell them, you know what? I'd hate to have you as my savior. <laughs> yeah. I haven't heard anybody answer me on that one yet. Now, Jesus couldn't have been a savior. He was like that person or me. Or anybody. He could not have been our Savior. One with God in purity and holiness, he was able to make a propitiation for the sins of the world. Christ is a complete Savior. It was a perfect sacrifice he offered on Calvary's cross that man might have a full and complete sanctification. Well, I can't read all of these. I have to get through all of what I want to do today. It says, they have not, the people who don't understand these things, they have not opened the door of the heart to welcome him as a heavenly guest. Who? Welcome who? Yeah, him, nobody else. It says they love themselves and their own ways. And that's exactly what Luther says in this chapter. Exactly what Ellen White said here. They love themselves and their own ways failing to realize that their ways, their words, their characters are opposed to God. Such can never reach perfection unless they uh, see themselves as they are. If the natural disposition, and Luther goes over to that one too. He says natural. He and Alan White talk the same way. We just haven't noticed it. It says if the natural disposition is not changed, if it remains as it was before, Christ spoke to them. They are lukewarm. Ah, oh, what is that? Do we know what lukewarm is? That's the problem after 1844. Do you remember? The latest in church. The latest in condition. So here is Ellen White saying they are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot. Christ says to them, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And now she tells us what he meant by that. I cannot plead in your behalf. 
You can't talk to the father about us? No, if we're lukewarm, we've been had. I cannot plead in your behalf, for you have no desire for my glory. Character, right? Glory is character. You have no desire to be like me. You want to make me like you. Do you see how horrible these errors are that have crept into the Seventh-day Adventist church? These people go to church, yes. I almost said something. I'm glad I didn't. Okay. Two, Spirit Prophecy, page nine. The Son of God was next in authority to the great lawgiver. Next. Does that mean there was somebody here and there's somebody here? They're not the same? One little clause destroys the Trinity right there. The Son of God was next. He knew that his life alone could be sufficient to ransom fallen man. His life alone, nobody else? Well, we know why the Father couldn't give his life. He's immortal, and that can't change. He's the only immortal one, it says that in First Timothy. The one that no man has ever seen. Have we seen Jesus? Yes, man has seen Jesus. So Jesus is not over there in First Timothy. That's the Father, the only one with immortality. Now we know that Jesus, as divinity, had immortality, but where did he get it? <laughs> From his Father. And we know that that was not unconditional immortality because he gave it up. He died. Now, I'm not going to get into that. Millions of people don't believe that in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You can't make them believe that. But that's the Bible. That's the spirit of prophecy. That's the truth. So let's continue here. He was as much more, more value than man in his noble, spotless character and exalted office as commander of all the heavenly hosts were above the work of man. He was the express image of the Father. Okay, I want to go down here in the paragraph. Man could not atone for man. His sinful fallen condition would constitute him an imperfect offering and atoning sacrifice of less value than Adam before his fall. Do you see what that means? The only being that could be the savior of man is one that was of more value than Adam before his fall. A pure, innocent Adam. He had to be more pure than Adam before his fall. Continuing here. God made man perfect and upright, and after his transgression there could be no sacrifice acceptable to God for him unless the offering made should in value be superior to man as he was in his state of perfection and innocency. How could, how could our Savior be a fallen man like Adam with that kind of a statement? Do you see how plain it is? The only thing God could accept is someone superior to man before he fell. And yet there are millions of people in the Adventist church who have no idea about this kind of a thing. Youth Instructor, June 2nd, 1898. The very first paragraph, so you don't have to read very far. Christ is called the second Adam in purity and holiness 
Are you getting this? The second Adam was like the first one. Impurity and holiness. Connected with God. And beloved by God. He began where the first Adam began. Connected with God in purity and holiness. How could Jesus be like us if he was like, he was superior to Adam before he fell? And he began where the first Adam began. In purity and holiness. Willingly, he, Jesus, passed over the ground where Adam fell. You see, he started over that holiness and purity, the same ground that Adam did. And then she says, and redeemed Adam's failure. That means he started where Adam did in holiness and purity. He walked over the same ground, but he didn't fail. <laughs> How clear can an Elohim make these things? Now, I'm reading all of this because the people out there who don't understand these things say the likeness of sinful flesh means he was just like us. Well, there's nothing we're reading in Ellen White that says that kind of thing. It's not there. They made it up. They're misusing the spirit of prophecy. 16 MR 120. But it was not the absence of external honor and riches and glory that caused the Jews to reject Jesus. The sun of righteousness shining amid the moral darkness in such distinct rays revealed the contrast between sin and holiness, purity and defilement, and such light was not welcome to them. Now, are you listening? Are you listening? Listen carefully and let the Spirit of Jesus talk to you. Here are the words that he puts next in this sentence. Christ was not such an one as ourselves. No, I just don't know how language can get any plainer than that. <laughs> Christ was not such a one as ourselves. The Jews could have borne their disappointed hopes better than they could the righteous denunciation of their sins. In parables, Christ laid bare their professed sanctity. He compared them to whited sepulchers, deceiving the people by their pretensions to piety. Well, I guess I better leave that alone. Let's continue here. I'm going to give a whole meeting on those words. 7 B.C., 9.15. Remember, we are just working with verse 3 of Romans. Do you see why we could never cover this in uh, just a few days? <laughs> 7 B.C., 9.15. The work of redemption is called a mystery, and it is indeed the mystery by which everlasting righteousness is brought to all who believe. The race in consequence of sin. By the way, all the people think that Jesus is just like us. Think that the only way you become a sinner is by choosing to become a sinner. But that's not in the Bible either. We are sinners because we're children of Adam. And they don't like that. They say that's Roman Catholic. No, it isn't. It's Romans 5.12. But I can't go over all their errors. And by the way, they got most of them from A.T. Jones. They believe in A.T. Jones, not Jesus or spirit prophecy. They're believing in the wrong person. Continuing. Christ, at an infinite cost, is any human infinite? Was Jesus the man infinite? He was a human, a real human. This says at infinite cost. That means divine. That is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. At infinite cost by a painful process. Mysterious to angels as well as to men. Assumed 
humanity. Painful. Trinitarians teach that God can't feel pain. Otherwise, he's not a Trinitarian. And neither is God. Hiding his divinity. They say he left his divinity behind. He gave it up. No. He hid it. The divine son of God in the man was still divine. And it says, hiding his divinity, laying aside his glory, he was born a babe in Bethlehem. In human flesh, he lived the law of God. Ah, Jesus lived in human flesh and never sinned. Well, I can't read the rest of that statement. It's a beautiful statement. Read it for yourself. Mount of Blessings 54. The prophet Hosea had pointed out what constitutes the very essence of Phariseeism. Okay, we're going to learn what a Pharisee is. Are you ready? Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth fruit unto himself. That's Phariseeism. He only lives for himself. Yeah, always thinking about what he's going to get for himself. A Pharisee even uses God. Oh, God, bless me in this or that. He didn't ask, Lord, what's your will? He said, bless me in what I want to do. That's a Pharisee. Let's keep reading here. The Jews... In the profess service to God, the Jews were really working for self. Their righteousness was the fruit of their own efforts to keep the law according to their own ideas. For their own selfish benefit. Hence, it could, not, it could be no better than they were. In their endeavor to make themselves holy, they were trying to keep, bring a clean thing out of unclean. The law of God is as holy as he is holy, as perfect as he is perfect. It presents to men the righteousness of God. It is impossible for man in himself, of himself, to keep this law for the nature of man is deprived, deformed, and holy, unlike the character of God. Well, you go read Mount of Blessings again some, sometime. That's another fantastic little book, just like Steps to Christ. Those two little ones say more things in there than the Adventist Church is teaching today. Just those two little books. Okay, let's go to verse 4. Patriarchs and Prophets, 77. Abel defended the justice and the goodness of God. He pointed out Cain's error and tried to convince him that the wrong was in himself. He pointed to the compassion of God and sparing the life of their parents when he might have punished them with instant death and urged that God love them or he would not have given his son. And that was an argument between the first human beings in the world. It was over the Son of God. Did you see that before? It says God would not have given his Son innocent and holy to suffer the penalty which they had incurred. That's the gospel. And it was being discussed there in the Garden of Eden between the first two babies. The gospel didn't come at the cross. That's what the Sunday keepers teach. It's right there, those two men. And this man came angry. An anger that just burned hotter. Youth instructor. Did you notice the one that was saying the son of Jesus, the son of God, is the one that got killed? 
Did you notice that? Who killed him? The one that believe, didn't believe Jesus is the Son of God. You think about that for a while. Youth Instructor, November 1, 1857. Now remember, this is to the youth of the church. You ought to read those youth instructors over carefully sometime because Ellen White says more things to those youth than she ever said to the adults. My heart is drawn out for the young. The great work of overcoming is before them. And the greatest task of all is to subdue self and obtain victory over natural resentments. Uh, hasty temper, pride, etc. I have seen professed Christians act out their natural infirmities, let their evil temper get the victory over them, and after the excitement is passed, reflection and reason teaches them they have greatly erred. They excuse themselves by saying, It's natural for me. <laughs> it's natural for me to be quick. It's my temperament. With some, pride is a besetting sin that must be subdued. But their excuse is, it is natural. I have heard the most covetous, selfish, when a reproof for their sins urges the excuse, it's natural. I was taught to be so. Oh, what an excuse for a Christian. It's natural. It's natural to give way to passionate temper. It's natural to indulge in pride. It's natural to be covetous and selfish. Let me ask you, professed Christian, are you going into heaven with all these natural infirmities unsubdued? No, never. Heaven will not be marred with the presence of any natural infirmity. So what are we talking about here? In those first four verses, Paul said, you're not condemned if you're in Jesus and you walk in the spirit and not the flesh. The flesh is natural. This is it. Ellen White is talking about the spirit and the flesh. So let's see what else she says here. Well, since these infirmities must be overcome, what shall we do? Shall we excuse ourselves by saying it's natural? Or shall we rather go about the work earnestly to subdue self and take the steps necessary to be taken to accomplish the object? It's natural is the excuse that comes from the carnal heart. So she just told us the people who say it's natural are not Christians. They're carnal. What is the carnal heart? It's the old man. And you can't become a Christian until the old man is dead. So there's a difference between the old man and the flesh. The old man dies, but the flesh doesn't. You still have a body. You're still alive. So let's continue here. The axe has not been laid at the root of the tree. There's not been a thorough acquaintance with the hard and poisonous weeds that choke every good growth have been permitted to flourish there. These evils must be rooted out. These resentments overcome or lose heaven. Look to the rock that is higher than you. Plead with God in secret prayer for grace. All these natural infirmities can be overcome by grace. But the natural carnal heart is not subject to the law of God. Nobody who has a natural heart can keep the law of God. It's impossible. All right. So it says, if the carnal mind is subdued, you will not hear so frequently. It is natural. Satan loves to hear this. His angels rejoice that you have not grace sufficient to overcome natural infirmities. They triumph at these words. It's natural. But Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. <laughs> yes, it is sufficient to overcome and subdue the natural carnal heart. 
You destruct your October 2nd, 1902. So Paul is telling us about the carnal heart versus the spirit heart, the spiritual heart. That's what we're working with right now. You destruct your October 2, 1902. The carnal mind rejects the truth. Oh, we could go a long way with that. When a person rejects the truth of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, that's a sign of the carnal mind. But the soul that is converted undergoes a marvelous change. The book that before was unattractive because it revealed truths which testified against the sinner now becomes the food of the soul, the joy and the consolation of the life. The Son of Righteousness illuminates the sacred pages and the Holy Spirit speaks through them to the soul. The who speaks to the soul? Jesus, the Holy Spirit, to man. Now, I said it that way because there are a lot of people who are still confused about that. They think they believe in the Father and Son, but they still don't know who the Son is. He's the Holy Spirit himself. He, Jesus, himself, is the Holy Spirit. To those who love Christ, the Bible, is as the garden of God. Its promises are as grateful to the heart as the fragrance of flowers to the senses. She says something very similar in Fundamental of Education, page 182. The heart that surrendered to God loves the truth of God's word. The carnal mind finds no pleasure. It says, uh, but he who is renewed in the spirit of his mind sees new charms. She uses that word charms someplace, doesn't she? We had a whole meeting on it. The matchless charms of Jesus. She never says that about anybody else. The charms of the Bible because it's his word. Jesus is the author of the Bible. Many times she says it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Well, of course, the Holy Spirit is Jesus. <laughs> We've got to start reading the Spirit of Prophecy properly. It's all there. It says, Divine beauty, celestial light seem to shine in every passage. That which the carnal mind finds a desolate wilderness to the spiritual mind becomes a land of living streams. It's blooming flowers. I'm not going to read anymore. We need to move here. We're just getting started. All right, let's read a little bit more here. It says, They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, verse 5, but they that are after the spirit, things of the spirit. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death. Carnally minded, the old man. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded that's the spirit of Jesus in you. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. The old man is an enemy of God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh, that means they obey the flesh instead of resisting it, cannot please God. Verse 9, but ye are not in the flesh. That means you don't obey the flesh. You still have it, and it still hates the law of God, and it still hates everything Jesus says, but you also have the righteousness of Jesus. That part of you loves God. That part of you loves Jesus. That part of you loves the law of God. And when you want to do the, the, the law of God because you love Jesus, you find something goes wrong. The flesh says, no, you're not. I don't want to do that. I want to survive. And if you keep that law, I won't survive. I'm going to be killed. 
Well, the flesh is going to die anyhow. That's what people are getting confused about. It's going to die. You can't get your new body if you still have the old one. Verse 9, it says, it says, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, there are people out there who are saying the Spirit of God here is the Father. And they're saying that the Father uses Jesus like a channel. And Jesus is just a tube that the Father goes through to get to us. That's not true. The fa Father is in heaven. Jesus is in heaven. The Spirit that comes to us is the Spirit of Jesus himself. He is the Holy Spirit to man. So let's read this the way Paul meant it. Now, if, if so be that the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, dwell in you, and everywhere in the New Testament, it's Jesus that's in you. There's only one verse I know about that says that the Father and the Son are in us. Yeah, John 14. But that doesn't mean the Father himself personally comes to be with us, because Jesus said to Philip, don't you know when you've seen me, you've seen the Father? People keep forgetting there's another part of the Bible to read. The Father never comes to us personally. It would destroy us. It would kill us. It's the Spirit of Jesus that comes to us. So it says, next, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, no, Paul says it all in the same verse. How come people don't read the rest of the verse? The Spirit of God, the one that dwells in us is the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of Christ. If we don't have the Spirit of Christ, if we have another kind of a spirit, no matter what you call it, we are none of Jesus. It must be Jesus or you're not a Christian. Hey, Christ Object Lessons, 251. But if you forgive not men these their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Matthew 6.15. Nothing can justify an unforgiving spirit. He who is unmerciful towards others shows that he himself is not a partaker of God's pardoning grace. In God's forgiveness, the heart of the erring one is drawn close to the great heart of infinite love. The tide of divine compassion flows into the sinner's soul and from him to the soul of others. The tenderness and mercy that Christ has revealed in his own precious life will be seen in those who become sharers of his grace. But if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So she's talking about a Christian and the spirit that they have, okay? If he has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. It says he is alienated from God, fitted only for eternal separation from him. It is true he may have once received forgiveness, but his unmerciful spirit shows that he now rejects God's pardoning love. He has separated himself from God and is in the same condition as before he was forgiven. He has denied his repentance. And his sins are upon him as if he had not repented. Now, that's a horrible thing. And we've got lots of people like that in the church. People who claim to be Christians and go around carrying things and putting people down. All right, 1SM 334. The faith which avails to bring us in vital contact with Christ expresses on our part supreme preference, perfect reliance, entire consecration. This faith works by love and purifies the soul. It works in the life of the follower of Christ, true obedience to God's commandments. For love to God and love to man will be the result of vital connection with Christ. It's always Christ. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 
Now, remember, this is the verse that said Spirit of God, and people are out there saying that means the Father. No, it's the Spirit of Christ. Christ is God. And there's even somebody out there saying it's idol worship to call Jesus God. Yeah, there's some very strange things going on in this world. 5T, 385. The true missionary spirit is the spirit of Christ. The world's redeemer was the great model missionary. Many of his followers have labored earnestly and unselfishly in the cause of human salvation, but no man's labor can bear comparison with the self-denial, the sacrifice, the benevolence of our exemplar. Just as soon as a person is really converted to the truth, there springs up in his heart an earnest desire to go and tell some friend or neighbor of the precious light, excuse me, shining forth from the sacred pages. In his unselfish labor to save others, he is a living epistle known and read of all men. His life shows that he has been converted by Christ and has become a co-laborer with him. With him, with Jesus. She says, Jesus stands at your side. He's not only in us, but there are times he's right there helping us by our side. That means he's helping us with somebody. That's another subject. But I want you to see there's much more in these sentences she's giving us. One, sermons and talks, 209. And if you forget everything we said today, remember this statement we're going to read. One, Sermons and Talks, page 209. I also send them into the world. It is just as much your work to act outright in the world as it was the work of Christ to redeem. He sent you into the world. You are to be the light of the world. You are to show the distinction between the spirit of Christianity and the spirit of the worldling. You are to show the controlling influence of the power of God upon the human heart. What? The controlling influence. Yes, we're supposed to control the flesh. And we're supposed to show the world how that works. I am in control of my flesh by the grace of Jesus Christ. I don't walk in the flesh. I walk in the spirit. It's a struggle. Yes. I fight every day. I have to fight my own inclinations every day. But I'm doing the fight. This is how Paul said, I fought the good fight. I'm ready now to lay it down. I have fought the good fight. We all have to say that. I have fought the good fight. If you don't fight, what are you going to say? <laughs> okay. So let's, let's get to the sentence here. God. Help us that we may be sanctified through the truth and the sanctification shall have its influence up to leaven those that are around us. Not the leaven of malice, not the leaven of jealousy, nor the leaven of yield surmising, but the leaven of the Spirit. Here it comes, listen. But the Spirit of Jesus Christ, which is sent down from heaven. That's the Spirit that comes from heaven. The Spirit of Jesus comes down from heaven called the Holy Ghost. Did you hear that? I've never heard a Trinitarian quote that. As a matter of fact, I've never even heard a father-son person quote it yet. That which comes down from heaven is not the Father. It's Jesus. It's Jesus' representative. She says that over and over. Listen, listen. It says it's the Spirit of Jesus Christ which is sent down from heaven called the Holy Ghost. And that Spirit affects the heart and character. You better get into your books or your computer or whatever you use and you underline it, highlight it, do whatever you have to, write it on the wall, look at it every day. Jesus Christ sent by who? <laughs> by the Father. It's the Father's part to send. 
It's Jesus' part to come. But he doesn't come personally. He sends his Holy Spirit. 14MR, page 22. Christ was using the great name of God that was given to Moses to express the idea of the eternal presence. Now, I'm not going to move through that sentence. It's loaded. Isaiah also saw Christ, and his prophetic words were full of significance. He says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. So I'm sorry to tell the people who think it's idolatry to worship Jesus as God, because that's what Isaiah calls him, the Mighty God. And the Father in Hebrews says to the angels, worship him. Well, I'm not going to go into that study. I don't know if people can miss all these things in the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy, but they, they do. Continuing. A son is given, the government should be called upon his shoulder, and his name should be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Jesus is the Father of the human race. He's the head of it. Just like Adam is the head of the old lost race, Jesus is the head of the new redeemed race. He's our father. That's going to take a lot of thinking because the best theologians in the world, and I'm using best in quotation marks, have never been able to understand Isaiah. Never. The everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace can't be anybody else but Jesus. The whole verse is about Jesus. The Pharisees were horrified. Well, we're learning some more about Pharisees. You ought to look up Pharisees sometime and see what kind of people they are, what they do, what they say. Yeah, it's very enlightening. The Pharisees were horrified at this declaration of Christ before Abraham was. I am. I am who? I am Jehovah. That's what he told Moses in Exodus 3. And there are people today who get horrified over that in the Christian church. They say, Jesus can't be the I am. He must have sent, meant something else. Maybe it was a, a metaphor, folks. Maybe it was a metaphor. No, he said, I am. They were besides themselves with rage. That he should express such awful blasphemy, claiming to be the I am. Because that's the name of God. Well, apparently the Pharisees didn't all die off way back then. Jesus is the I am. Read Desire of Ages, the first chapter sometime, carefully, and see how many times Ellen White says it. Mount of Blessings, page 28. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The spirit of peace is evident in their connection with heaven. The sweet savor of Christ surrounds them, the fragrance of the life, the loveliness of the character. Reveal to the world the fact that they are children of God. Take knowledge of them that they have been with Jesus, everyone that loveth is born of God. If a man have not the spirit of Christ, he's done of his. But as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. <laughs> well, I think I'm going to have to set, stop right there. We're only up to verse 9. No, I can't stop there. 
who knows when we're going to get back in this setting. Let's drop down to verse 32. Because there's a summation there in verse 32. Patriarchs and Prophets 69. When Satan was thrust out of heaven, he determined to make the earth his kingdom. When he tempted and overcame Adam and Eve, he thought that he had gained possession of this world because he said, they have chosen me as their ruler. He claimed that it was impossible that forgiveness should be granted to the sinner and therefore the fallen race. There he said it again. All right. <laughs> Jesus said it again through Alan White, the fallen race, not each person that chooses to sin. The fallen race were his rightful subjects and the world was his. But God gave his own dear son, one equal with himself, to bear the penalty of transgression. So who died at Calvary? Do you want me to read it again? God gave his own dear son, one equal with himself, one equal with God, died on Calvary. You can't make it just a human. Not with this sentence, you can't. It's one equal with God. And thus he provided a way by which they might be restored to his favor and brought back to the Eden home. It was the marvel of all the universe that Christ should humble himself to save fallen man, that he who had passed from star to star, from world to world, superintending all by his providence, supplying the needs of every order of being in his vast creation. Who is the creator? In his vast creation, that he should consent to leave his glory. Trinitarians say, Jesus, the Father and the Son cannot be separated. So either that means all three of them came to heaven to do the plan of salvation, or none of them. <laughs> you can't have Jesus coming here by himself. But that's exactly what he did. He left heaven. He left his glory, and he'd take upon himself human nature. He was a mystery which the sinless intelligence of other worlds desired to understand. Review and Herald, May 4th, 1876. I have to give you this paragraph because you have to read all the way down to paragraph 65. How many people are going to do that? <laughs> Just to find one quest. I'll let make it easy for you. It's paragraph 65. <laughs> all right, let's read. In the popular churches, we hear but little except, do you love Jesus? The love of the Father is scarcely mentioned. It is only Christ. Christ. God the Father has given unto man the greatest gift that heaven has. Now, if Jesus is the greatest gift, then when Jesus went back to heaven, how could he give a higher gift? The highest gift had already been given. It was Jesus. So what did Jesus give? He said, I give you a gift. It was his own spirit. It was himself again. Only it wasn't the Father giving him this time. It was himself giving his spirit. These, these senses are everywhere in the spirit prophecy, the truth. But unless we want the truth, we're not going to see it. We're going to keep looking for things that are reinforcing our own personal opinions that says behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of god i believe that the heart of the great god is touched and moved by the condition of sinners today as when he gave his son to die for the sins of the world christ says i and my father are one that is one in purpose, one in mind, one in character. All right. It says, sinners and backsliders, it's your duty to believe that God loves you. And she's saying both the Father and the Son love us. 
And that Christ loves you, the Redeemer of the world made a great sacrifice to purchase for you everlasting life. Christ Object Lessons 174. You who feel the most unworthy, fear not to commit your case to God. When he gave himself in Christ for the sin of the world, he undertook the case of every soul. When he gave himself in Christ, people misread that one and say, well, that's the Father giving himself in Christ. That's not what she's saying. She said, when he, as God, gave himself in Christ, the man, see? Jesus, as God, gave himself through that humanity. He undertook the case of every soul. And then she goes back to the Father. He that spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans 8, 32. That's verse 32. That's what we're looking at. Will he not fulfill the gracious word given for our encouragement and strength? Christ desires nothing so much as to redeem his heritage from the dominion of Satan. But before we are delivered from Satan's power without, that's the body. That's what the body does. The actions. Before we are delivered from the body without, we must be delivered from his power within. And that's now. The Lord, listen carefully. I'm glad we're going to finish this way. The Lord <clears throat> permits trials. Now let your ears open up. We're talking about trials. You know something about trials, okay? The Lord permits trials in order that we may be cleansed from earthliness, from selfishness, from harsh, unchristlike traits of character. Do you have trials? Well, guess why you have them? You need them! <laughs> And if you don't get the trials, you are never going to get where you want to get. <laughs> so you ought to be thanking God and rejoicing. He's giving you the trials you need. He suffers the deep waters of affliction to go over our soul. So oh, that's a pretty good picture. The trials is burying us in water here. Go over our souls in order that we may know him. And Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. <gasps> Do we believe in John 17, 3? Well, then you better start thanking God for those trials, because that's how you get to know him. And Jesus, whom he has sent. In order that we may have deep heart longings. This is what I said last time as we close. This comes to us so we can know Jesus in order that we may have deep longings to be cleansed from defilement and may come forth from the trial pure, holier, happier. Often we enter the furnace of trial with our souls darkened with selfishness. But if patient, under the cruel test, we shall come forth reflecting the divine character. When his purpose in the affliction is accomplished, he shall bring forth Thy righteousness. Yes. The word is righteousness, not righteousness by faith. Righteousness, that's you, your character, who you're going to be forever. He will bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Psalm 37, verse 6. <laughs> yeah, all the things that the church has taught us to think are hard and we need to avoid them. Forget it. We love them. We love everything God wants to give us. We love the whole plan. We love the trials. We don't feel, they don't feel good. He never said make them feel good. Never. They still feel bad. <laughs> but we should love them. And say they're doing what I need. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
for being my savior. Father, we're just touching the edges. You're trying to teach us and you're trying to bring us up, but you know what you have to work with. We have been all but ruined by the sayings of men. Oh, let us hear your voice. Let us hear the spirit of prophecy through Alan White. Let us know that you're dealing with us. And may we rejoice that we can leave that arm of flesh because we know what it is now. It's the arm of death. And give us the life of Jesus. Amen.